Good morning. My name is Janavi Maheshwari Kanuria, and I'm very excited to share my story with you. Today, I'm going to teach you the alphabet. So A stands for apple, B stands for ball, C stands for cat, and D stands for doll. But you already know this. And so do a majority of our children around the world who have the privilege of being in school. But this is not the case for 263 million children who are globally out of school. That is one in every five children. What's really worrying is that this crisis is just growing and it's growing at the pace of 30% every single year. In addition to that, we have 130 million children who finish four years of schooling without learning how to read or do basic addition. Now, everyone says that this is an impossible challenge to solve. Everyone says there's no solution. And they're right. Because if we continue the same conventional system of education, these children will always be unreached. And frankly, any system that is failing one out of every five of its beneficiaries needs to be seriously reconsidered. But then we had this golden opportunity to reconsider. Because in April 2019, when the pandemic started, our conventional education system came to a grinding halt. And schools around the world closed down. And every single child was suddenly out of school. So we as educators had this opportunity to be agile and innovative and think of really new and different ways to reach each and every one of these learners everywhere, they, the, wherever in the world they were. And so what did we do? we all moved to different models of online schooling. And now let me show you how that worked. For a second, just close your eyes. Now, what do you think of when I say distance or remote learning? Now open your eyes. I know what you were thinking, but come on a journey with me for a second. So imagine I took away your distance learning superpower. No internet, no online school, no Zoom calls with teachers, no videos, no games, no emails. Now imagine that I took away all your physical resources. So no textbooks, actually no books of any kind, no stationery, no educational resources. Now imagine that I told you your parent who is at home with you is semi-literate or has to go out to earn a daily living and cannot support you with your education. Now, finally, imagine that I told you that you had no technology whatsoever. No iPads, no computers, no smartphones, not even TV or radio. Now, this is the reality of distance education for more than 50% of households in developing countries. No technology, very few resources, and no access to a parent who can overnight become an educator. So it should not come as a surprise to you then that 465 million children were completely unreached through the course of the pandemic. That's one in every four children. But then I work at Education Above All. And Education Above All is a Qatar-based foundation that focuses on the most marginalized children around the world, and we help them access quality learning. And I lead our innovations team. So my role is to find some of the hardest to solve, trickiest problems and design and pilot new solutions for these. And I'm very happy to report progress. In the last two years, our innovations team reached almost one million children. We worked with a network of fantastic champion partner organizations on the ground and we reached children in Sudan, in Morocco, in Lebanon, in India, in Pakistan, in Kenya, in Afghanistan, and some of the most deprived contexts. We worked with children who were refugees. We worked in urban slums. We worked with tribal children. And we worked in the most remote of rural contexts. We even worked in some places where there were no schools. Forget them being closed. We worked in some places where there were no books. 
We worked in places there was no access to educated teachers. And some of the places we worked, the only technology available was a simple feature phone. And that too, it was shared between family members. So I have to apologize in advance because the pictures I'm going to show you moving forward have been taken by some of these feature phones. But we developed what is known as the Internet Free Education Resource Pack, or IFERB. Now, IFERB is more a learning approach. It consists of multiple different educational resources. And the idea is that children should be able to learn from their own surroundings, inspired by things around them. The very simple philosophy is designed to help all children, whether they're special needs learners, and really any child who's between the ages of 2 and 14. And all of this is available to be technology free, low resource requiring and very, very easily facilitated. And by implementing these around the world, I have learned some very fundamental lessons. I want to share these five shifts with you. So shift number one, we move from teacher led to community based. We very rightfully eulogize our formal education teachers so much so that sometimes we forget our first teachers, our families. But at homes with low literacy, they are sometimes so excluded from the learning journey and that causes a huge chasm in learning proficiency. So what we did, because we did not have any access to such teachers, is we decided to capitalize on the really powerful life lessons that some of these communities know and a lot of their innate knowledge. So we had grandmothers in Kenya tell their grandchildren folk stories so that the children could learn literacy in the absence of any books. So the children listened to the stories, they then rethought them, they reimagined them, they modernized them and they authored these beautiful storybooks. In some parts of the world, these storybooks have been placed into small community libraries that the children made themselves. Imagine this happening in a place which had never previously seen a book. I want to now tell you the story of 12-year-old Leba. So Leba grew up in a very conservative district in Pakistan. Most of her conversations with her mother were about mundane topics like errands, cooking, groceries and so on. And then she had to work on the family tree project. So her mother, being the primary source of information, had to share a lot of information with her and she had to interview her mother constantly to gain all of this knowledge. She then, over the course of the week, represented this information to her mother. She shared a geographical map of migration to show her where the family came from. She showed Venn diagrams to illustrate commonalities and differences between family members and also talk about genetics. And then she took two statistical representations to share the average age of certain incidents or events in their family lives. Her mother was so impressed with her daughter's abilities that she herself took a very bold move. She cancelled her impending child marriage and re-enrolled her into school. All it took was Leba to showcase her own talents to her own mother. Shift number two, from classrooms to streets. Learning has become like a job, right? It's 7 a.m. to 2 p.m. and it's within these four walls of a classroom. But you know, when school buildings close down, we had this opportunity to free learning. So now it can happen anytime and anywhere. And actually it can happen all the time and everywhere. So just imagine what happened when children set up stores on the streets. They wanted to attract customers, so they made colorful and beautiful posters. They sold everything that they thought could be sold, from agricultural produce to homemade handicrafts. They learned literacy and numeracy by preparing invoices. But you know what they really learned? the very tough art of negotiation. And just imagine the magic of the mud streets of Zambia converting into number lines. Children are jumping and they're playing while they're practicing simple math. I can promise you that it'll take us much less than four years to teach them simple addition. 
Shift number three, from globally standardized to locally relevant. You know, the people who write curriculum are often educators who are sitting in ministries in faraway capital cities, and they can't even imagine the lives of many of these children. For us too, it was impossible to imagine that these children had no idea what a comic was, they hadn't seen a book, they had never seen a newspaper, and in some cases, they didn't even know what the news was. So we had to really think about learning that was relevant to them. And in a really standard example for us, in a tribal area of Chhattisgarh, which is a Maoist-dominated conflict zone in India, learners told us that they had never seen an apple to identify with the letter A. They normally eat the staple forest produce. So what we did is we told these tribal children to design their own alphabet book. And often A is more accurately represented with an axe or an arrow. And then when we moved to Sudan and we tried to teach them about geography, they asked us to teach them about floods because that's what happens there. So we had children design their own different models to understand how flooding happens and what human behaviors cause floods. They designed their own evacuation plans. And then do you know how they learned density? No, not in science labs. They learned density by making their own personal flotation devices. And these life jackets were made out of scrap plastic bottles. And then finally, think about how different the same project would look to two different children. So a simple project that we had around making our own ID cards. For a nine-year-old Arif, who was an Afghan boy in a refugee camp in the US, it was his way to hold on to his past, to his identity. It was also his way to understand and learn about the new people around him. But for 14-year-old Hasina, it was the first time anyone had ever asked her about her preferences. It was the first time that she had a personal identity which was different from the village collective identity. Just imagine how simple a space we need to create for projects to become different for different learners. And now, shift number four. We need to stop asking our students to stay silent and raise their hand. Let's please start asking them to speak up and use those hands. So everywhere in the world that we worked, we actually had to convince our learners that there's no example to copy, there's no formula, there's no format, and you have to use your own creativity and imagination. But you know, once unbridled, it was like magic. These children are unstoppable. I want to tell you about an example when we were learning about COVID-19. And this is in the early days when there was limited awareness and there was a lot of misinformation. So children from Kashmir to Kenya learned how to practice sanitation by washing their hands and understanding basic practices of hygiene. They then went on to understand how germs spread by doing multiple experiments. And then finally, they had to design their own house rules for COVID. Now they went one step ahead and they said, let's design our entire village rules so that the village knows how to distance. In places where there were no masks, they said, let's design our own masks. And in one standout example, they even created their own contactless sanitizers. This is what our children can do, so let's stop underestimating them. And finally, shift number five, from facts to discovery. We didn't have access to textbooks, so we did not have the ability to say, here's the right answer. We just had to let students run with it. We had to let them observe, make their own conclusions, create hypotheses, experiment, and really hopefully come to the right answer. So in an example from Lebanon, where the children were working on a population census project. Now, in this project, they are supposed to interview their family members who are at home, and then create a lot of different statistical representations of the information and come to certain key conclusions. Now, the conclusion they came to 
was that the unemployed women at home worked harder and longer than the formerly employed men in their families. Not only this, the women were also more ambitious. Now, this is a lesson that can never be taught. So, if I can leave you today with one thought, it would be the sense of possibility. Wherever there is a genuine desire to learn, there will be a means to move forward. The reality is that COVID-19 exposed some of the deep-rooted inequities in our society, and it was a huge setback. But it was also a great opportunity to be completely unshackled from the constraints of curriculum and classrooms and assessments. So in places where there was no technology and no schools, our fantastic implementing partners designed their own makeshift outdoor school spaces. They, they put loudspeakers in the community so that the children could hear instructions. They used group-based phone calls. They even wrote instructions on the village wall. And despite all odds, we had 80% of the children in our program finishing it. So in places where there were no materials, we designed our own materials. Children made their own rulers, they made their own scientific tools, they made their own dice. And in one lovely example, they made their own walkie-talkies so that they could stay connected when there was a lockdown. And when there were no teachers, we had to rely on our own self-belief. So children observed, experimented, drew, painted, and did whatever they needed to, to come to their own conclusions in learning. They relied on older siblings, family members, and whoever they had access to. And doing so, we made some miraculous leaps in learning. We learned over 18% in just three months. And not just this, learning was a lot of fun. We had students proactively line up outside their facilitators' homes and ask for the instructions for the day. We had them beg their parents that they could join the program. And if you see in this picture, you would know that we had an oversubscription to one of our programs by almost 250%. And you know, our fantastic partner organizations on the ground championed the cause to the extent that even skeptical parents or government bodies changed their minds. So a year after we finished our pilots, 70% of them have continued using the same methodologies. And I tell you all this because I know it's possible. All our materials are open source, cost-free, and available on our website. So please try it for yourselves. We have hundreds of IFORB resources, from project-based learning, to game-based learning, to activity-based learning. And each of them promises a week long of learning. And it integrates lots of different subjects, makes it very interesting, and mimics the real world. But luckily, we're also not the only ones. We're just one in a glittering sea of examples of such change which has come out in these very difficult times. And all this does is prove to us that we're out of excuses. So imagine a world with me, where A stands for an aeroplane, but A also stands for an animal. Imagine a world where A stands for Australia, but it also stands for Angola. Imagine a world where every single one of our children is learning, no matter what their context might be. Imagine a world in which we score a five out of five.